They say third time's the charm, and for the Stalker series, a charm was becoming more and more necessary. While the series had garnered a cult following, its time in the spotlight was fading. While Shadow of Chernobyl had done a great job of creating interest, Clear Sky had done a great job of giving the franchise a reputation as buggy and uninviting. A new game was needed now, one that combined the best elements of both previous titles while also competing with the ever-growing crop of other open-world shooters. Call of Pripyat had some large shoes to fill, and with more and more challenges from upcoming titles like Fallout New Vegas or Metro 2033, it needed to hit home hard. Was this call worth picking up, or should it go to the machine instead? Well, that clears things up. Take them down. From the get-go, Call of Pripyat establishes that this is not going to be like Clear Sky, but a completely new experience, and this won't exactly be the zone as you remember it. Picking up after the events of Call of Chernobyl, the zone has now become irreparably changed by the Mark I's actions. This has prompted a military response in the form of a helicopter team, only for that mission to go sideways and everyone end up dead. Deciding on a more deft and less costly touch, the military has instead decided to send you, Major Dick Triev, a former stalker turned soldier, to find out what happened. Donning some stalker armor, you are let loose into the zone with only a vague sense of direction and an assault rifle. The biggest and most immediate change Call of Pripyat makes is the zone itself. While the previous games were quote unquote open world, they always felt constricted by the relatively small maps made more obvious by the few truly open areas like the swamps or the garbage. This led to a strange mixture of somewhat open maps but with constant loading screens between them, giving the games a cut up and disjointed feel. Pripyat avoids that by only having three maps of absolutely colossus size. Hmm. Looks like the direct route is not an option. No worry. Real men often take the back road. This has a few advantages, the most obvious being the freedom of movement. Every map has a handful of marked areas of interest, usually either for quests or notable anomalies where you can find artifacts. Every one of these areas allows for multiple ways to approach, allowing the player in turn a much greater sense of freedom in how they want to tackle the situation. If you are able to find a decent scope, you can pick off enemies from a distance before moving in to mop up survivors. Prefer to rush with shotguns and SMGs, then you can bounce from cover to cover as you move. Every form of combat is now viable, and with only one notable exception, you're never boxed into a claustrophobic experience. The more open maps also allow the A-Life AI system a greater degree of spontaneity, creating a more dynamic and, at times, interesting zone. AI squads of stalkers will wander from objective to objective, occasionally running into enemy factions and breaking into firefights which the player can choose to interact with or just watch, looting the losers for scraps. Groups of mutants will also roam around, running into the aforementioned stalkers or occasionally each other for bloody confrontations. Choosing when, where, and who to fight makes crossing the zone a much more dangerous experience than previous games. Good to go? Ready. What? I'm always ready. Also, ready. I have a bad feeling about this. Everyone's ready. Open it up. Roger. Let's rock. That's good. Go. Good luck, boys. Not that Call of Pripyat is an unpleasant experience. Actually, quite the opposite, thanks to a slew of quality of life improvements that have been added. If you catch up to a friendly squad of stalkers on their way to somewhere, you can tag along or even pay them to fast travel somewhere else, cutting down on the tedious walking. There's no more restrictions on equipped weapons, allowing you to use both a rifle and shotgun at the same time, which opens up new loadout options. Weapon repairs and modifications are back and more greatly expanded, and there's a much greater sense of balance to everything, making this probably the most accessible stalker game yet. Finally is the stability of Pripyat, a huge improvement over the previous titles. Not once in my hours on hours of playing the game or during this recording have I ever had it crash on me, and it's little wonder it's become the go-to recommended stock title for new players. Core gameplay is largely unchanged from Clear Sky. Shooting remains your primary interaction with the world, 
and Pripyat's tweaks makes it the best in the series so far. It's still not a perfect shooter, enemies can be bullet sponges, and most of the guns never feel totally accurate, but it all feels much more balanced than Clear Sky ever did. Several new types of items have been added for extra buffs, like extra carrying weight or greater resistance to damage types, but you'll mostly be sticking with medkits, bandages, and any artifacts you find to soldier your way through. As for difficulty, it is still a challenging game in comparison to contemporary shooters, but it's never truly brutal, and with some patience and planning, any challenge the game throws at you can be handled without issue. Kowalski, something strange is going on here. There were loads of monolith fighters inside the building. They were all in a trance and talking to a pile of trash. I examined this pile, and if you cut through the crap, it resembles a primitive antenna. It seems that someone talks to them through this antenna, and they believe it to be divine intervention. Perhaps the biggest improvement this time, though, is the writing. Clear Sky's story was unfocused and disjointed, and its side quests were largely unimportant. Every quest line in Pripyat is fully realized, and some of them offer alternative paths for increased replayability and added player choice. Many of these are the best stories in the series, with my particular favorite quest involving recruiting other stalkers for a dangerous underground raid, somewhat reminiscent of a heist movie. Most quest lines will also offer substantial rewards, such as rare weapons or ammo and supply drops on a daily basis, making them much more attractive to complete. Visually, Pripyat also makes a number of improvements over Clear Sky. Visual effects have been reworked to be less distracting, like the blurring during reloads or the look of certain anomalies. Even a decade on, Pripyat is a decent looking game, once again making great use of dynamic lighting and shadows and atmosphere to cover up an otherwise drab world. Levels all feel very distinct from each other, from the dried up lake bed of Xanton to the industrial lots of the Yanov zone, and finally into the deserted streets of Pripyat itself. In a welcome upgrade too, NPCs finally look at least passable, with noticeable improvements to their animations. They left one rookie by the entrance to keep an eye out for it. Of course, come morning, soon as the newbie saw the beast, he shat his pants and legged it, so I had to deal with it myself. Successfully, as you can see. <laughs> the audio of Call of Pripyat remains a standout, and a lot of work has gone into making this the most immersive stalker game yet. Weapon sounds, while never quite as punchy as I'd like, sound fine, and there's careful consideration between the different rifles, pistols, and shotguns that make them easily identifiable from a distance. Voice work is greatly improved with some decent performances and memorable characters, and the music is moody and atmospheric. The ambient audio though is the clear high point, and it's almost worth turning the music off just to sit back and get totally immersed in everything. With a good pair of headphones, Pripyat can be a great game to draw you in. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl was an ambitious but flawed game that lay out an interesting idea for the franchise, and Clear Sky was a buggy mess that nearly took that idea away. Call of Pripyat, though, is an impressive title, not only for successfully rewriting the franchise, but also making it accessible for anyone and everyone to get into. And if you asked me to recommend a Stalker game to somebody that's never played them before, this would be my go-to. It's infectiously playable, with plenty to keep you busy and interesting stories to tell. And over a decade later, I still find myself revisiting it constantly. Watch carefully and follow me. And for the longest time, that was the official Stalker series. After Call of Pripyat, there was constant attempts at a sequel, but GSC Game World, never a major studio, just couldn't find anyone to publish it, leading the IP to end up in purgatory. There are several fan games, many of which are actually better than the official titles I've talked about, and I will be making videos on some of them at a later date. More importantly though, there is finally an official Stalker 2 in the works, courtesy of Microsoft, due out in 2022. Whether that continues the legacy or takes it in a new direction remains to be seen. Until then though, there is still plenty to do in the zone. Thanks for watching and join me next time as we go underground for another Eastern Horror Shooter franchise. Major, find out what happened. What the hell? Hmm. You be careful out there, okay?
And Major, keep me posted.